Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this, uh, this edition this week for uh, updates on what's going on in the world of immigration. And uh, we are here today to um, tell you a little bit about what's happening in immigration and then answer your questions. And we'll answer questions generally about immigration law, about things that you wonder about your own cases or about um, some of the litigation that we're doing around the country. So if you're interested in uh, learning about that, just post your questions. Uh, in the comment section, and we'll take those at the end of the call. But before we get into it, um, there's some big, exciting things that have happened this week. Let's start with immigration reform. Is potentially immigration reform on the horizon, Zach? Potentially it is. So I was going to take you guys all through this fun uh, little tutorial of the U.S. Uh, legislative branch and how dysfunctional it is and why we're going through this budget re reconciliation process rather than just passing bills like a, a legislature should be doing. Um, generally speaking, you would think, okay, when a bill is passed in, in, uh, in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, it, it requires 50 votes in uh, the majority in order to be passed. Generally, that's correct. But there is this process in the Senate called the filibuster, which originally was, uh, I mean, it required you to stand up and talk for extended periods of time. Um, but it's kind of, I guess, evolved from this, uh, this more, I guess, archaic, uh, you know, people reading from the phone book type thing into a, just a, a mechanism by which uh, the minority party in the Senate can say, we don't agree to this and we're not going to uh, move forward with the uh, with discussion, with debate, with voting on this. Um, because of that, uh, in order for a bill to move forward in the Senate generally, it requires 60 votes. Right now, the Democrats have 50 votes in the Senate. So in order to get any big bill passed, it has to be through some sort of special mechanism or it requires bipartisan support. Um, immigration is a hot topic. Uh, immigration reform is difficult to get uh, a lot of votes on. A lot of people, you know, coming in together and everybody has their own ideas about whether the H2 H2 program is a great idea, or if the H1B program is filled with fraud, it needs to be just eliminated altogether. Um, you know, all these things. Uh, I'll say things like uh, the DREAM Act, you know, that is supposed to be putting out a pathway for citizenship for folks with DACA and those who came as children. Wide bar uh, bipartisan support, but nobody wants to give the other side a win, so it just never moves forward. I think there's been depending on how you count it, 15 to 20 different iterations of this uh, DREAM Act um, introduced by both Republicans and Democrats since 2001, I think it was. Um, but anyways, we're just about there, it seems like. Um, so what's budget reconciliation then? Um, there are certain bills that have to pass, that they don't have to go through the same uh, procedure. They have special rules to them. Um, and one of them is the budget. The budget is not subject to the filibuster. And in fact, the budget doesn't even need to be signed by the president if it doesn't include all these kind of like amendments to the end of them. Um, the way it's, it works, uh, you know, where we add all these kind of substantive laws on top of these, these budgets, the president does have to sign them. But um, Still, it's immune to the, to the filibuster, so only requires a simple majority to um, And we have that, right? We've got definitely have a simple majority. Not the simple majority. And so that's the uh, what makes this very exciting, that we actually have this, uh, this moving forward, where we have a simple majority in the Senate who could pass uh, you know, this uh, budget reconciliation bill that would include potentially all of these uh, kind of major reforms, including the DREAM Act, the uh, the Promise Act, uh, dealing with uh, temporary protected status, uh, Farm Workers Moder Modern Farm Worker Modernization Act. Um, there's a provision about uh, essential workers having a pathway to citizenship. All of these like incredibly popular and really really necessary uh, bills are going to be included in this budget reconciliation. You know, major overhaul um, that will be sent to the Senate. That'll um, you know, hopefully be passed by a simple majority there, by all the Democrats there. We won't have anybody who kind of backs out and says, you know, this is too much money. Um, and if that's the case, then it gets you know, passed, it gets sent up to the, uh, to the president for signature. And if that uh, happens, then it becomes law. A couple of things that could happen along the way, though, because we're talking about a budget bill and it does have these kind of, um, I guess, extra, um, 
yeah, it does away with protections for the minority party. That's a big reason that the filibuster exists, is that we want to at least have some uh, some semblance of, of minority rights in the Senate. We don't want uh, you know, 51 votes to mean that you can pass whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, so that's why the, the filibuster kind of still is, is sticking around. Um, but um, yeah, broadly speaking, coming back to the budget, um, when you're adding on these amendments to a budget bill, they have to relate to the budget in some way. You have to be able to say, okay, this is going to um, decrease the deficit. This is, uh, or this is a, a neutral uh, a spending bill that's going to impact the economy in a positive way. Um, if there is something that's kind of like an investment, then you have to offset that with some sort of uh, like a tax increase. That's uh, one of the, the provisions in the budget reconciliation bill, for example, is investment in climate research, and that's going to be offset by increases in corporate tax rates. Um, for our purposes, though, what we've got is an instruction to the House Judiciary Committee to uh, basically create a pathway to citizenship for you know, TPS holders, for DACA holders, for folks who didn't necessarily qualify for DACA, but um, are otherwise kind of you know, this, the same thing. Um, uh, be folks who perhaps weren't here on uh, 12, 2007, but you know, for all other uh, kinds of purposes, are are you know, qualified for DACA. Um, so you know, it would include that. It would include the the uh, temporary protected status. It would include farm worker modernization. It would include this pathway to citizenship for essential workers, um, and all of that has to be kind of argued as well. Okay, immigrants are are. You know, a net positive on the economy, and by having this, this, um, you know, these various uh, bills come through, these various laws that will allow for folks who are kind of you know, stuck in this uh, this limbo state to um, you know, become full fledged members of the workforce. We're going to see a, a, you know, a positive impact on the economy, or at least that's the argument that has to be uh, accepted by this person called the Senate parliamentarian. Um, if they disagree those amendments just get stricken out of the budget uh, reconciliation bill. We have to move forward without them and they have to go through the normal process. So it's kind of a very high level overview about where we're at right now. Um, if you look at the bill that was passed, it's not very substantive. It says basically, okay, you get $110 billion to put these laws together. Um, you get $200 billion to do these things. Um, and you know, it's a sentence or two. It's not uh, it's more instructions than it is a, like a substantive document. But that what comes along with that is a, a memorandum that is sent to these various committees to say, hey, you have to put together this type of legislation and here's your budget cap, basically. Um, so those budget, those uh, committees will, will come out with their own bills that, that address these things and they'll get uh, lumped together with this budget reconciliation. And um, yeah, it's a very exciting time because in the next two months we could see uh, you know, a Dream Act finally passed. We could see, uh, you know, finally a, a pathway to permanent residency for uh, TPS holders who've been here for you know, since the '90s and have had their whole been here their whole lives. Um, uh, the House is going on on recess um, end of August, I believe, and Senate's coming back on, in September. So we would expect a uh, debate and kind of really the, the substantive, uh, uh, I guess, parts of this to move forward in September. Um, when we need the budget to be passed because the fiscal year for uh, the, the federal government starts on October 1st. So yeah, very exciting stuff. Um, next two months, we might have a drastically different landscape in, uh, in the way that the, the U.S. immigration system works for a lot of undocumented folks or folks who are in these kind of very you know, liminal and very uh, temporary statuses. Uh, so exciting stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to throw out my uh, usual whenever we have something like this that happens, the notarios and the crooked lawyers come out of the woodwork to charge you money to do things that they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it, I guess what I'm trying to say to you is nothing is is happened yet. There is no Dream Act. You're going to hear people saying, come sign up for the Dream Act. It doesn't exist yet. We don't know what the requirements are. We won't know until the Judiciary Committee meets and comes up with the plan. So um, in the meantime, it, it's a good idea to start gathering documents, right? If you don't have your original birth certificate or your original marriage certificate, start gathering your biographical documents. Get a passport if you don't have one. Contact your, your country's embassy and get a passport. 
uh, gather up proof that you've been physically present in the country. What I recommend is an official document for every 90 days. So, you know, some sort of government document or a bill from a utility or a, a doctor's letter or a school report, some official document for every 90 days that establishes your physical presence going back. So what that means is essentially four documents per year for your physical presence in the country. Um, you should meet with an accountant or a, an accounting company to pay your taxes. If you haven't done that uh, for the past, you can back pay, you can start paying now going forward. Uh, because in, in the past, these legalization programs have required proof of either taxes or that you're on some sort of uh, payment plan for the future. Um, and then if you have criminal histories, gather up your criminal records, uh, go to the courts and get certified copies of the conviction documents from your criminal cases. Uh, that's going to be important as well. Any other documents that we can think about that, we, that the government might want to see uh, for legalization? I mean, it's really the biographic stuff that, that normally holds things up. Uh, you know, the, the little things that, that kind of come up, it's a lot easier to gather, you know, your most recent lease, you know, where you've been physically residing recently. But, you know, when you're talking about where were you living at five years ago, for example, you know, it's a lot more difficult to, to gather in a short time. And I imagine if uh, we do have this, uh, this stuff passed and all these programs implemented, uh, there's going to be a a mad rush to get things filed so for sure yeah, having those those kind of harder to collect you know further back documents and your biographical documents are definitely what you want to to collect now absolutely anything to add jennifer to that no i think that all sounds great it's exciting stuff hopefully it happens <laughs> all right well let's talk yeah. about the second thing that we wanted to discuss this week which is uh ice just today released new civil enforcement priority um, guidelines, and especially with regard to victims, non-citizen victims. So Jennifer, tell us about what's going on with that. Yeah, so there's a new directive that came out, like Jeff said, um, and basically ICE is now going to be training its officers on how to prioritize or really deprioritize um, non-citizen victims of crimes. And this applies to mainly to people who are either eligible for T visas, which is for victims of human trafficking, U visas, which is victims of certain crimes. There's a whole list of qualifying crimes for that that's available um, on the USCIS website, US Citizenship and Immigration Services website. Um, VAWA, which is the Violence Against Women Act. So that's um, victims of spousal abuse. If you're the spouse of a citizen, US citizen or a permanent resident of the United States. And then also um, special immigrant juvenile status um, applicants or, or beneficiaries, um, which are people who have children who have been abandoned or abused or neglected by a parent. Um, and so what's exciting about this is that ICE is, is now going to be, according to the directive, trained on and required to actively find out if someone is a victim of a crime by searching databases if they come into contact with them. And this means that people in removal proceedings already um, may be eligible for prosecutorial discretion to have their case terminated um, or to have their case continued if they're waiting on benefit. Um, one of those visas that I just mentioned, the U visa, T visa, something like that. Um, and so that's exciting because there's already some case law out there that kind of allows for continuances for certain types of cases like this in removal proceedings, but this really expands that. Um, and kind of puts it more on ice to notify the court and, and places like that when someone is the victim of a crime. The other thing that it does is it allows ice to ask U visa cases and cases like that to be expedited if a person is in proceedings. Um, but again, like, like a lot of other things, this is discretionary. So if someone, there's a couple of exceptions that are in the directive, but if someone is, I think it's a, let's see, poses a national security concern or poses a risk of death, violence, or physical harm to someone, they would not be eligible um, under this. That makes directive. sense. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that makes good sense. Um, and so yeah, there's, it's this like 12 page directive, but there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, and I think the big thing also is the training component of it, that they're actually gonna train the officers on this. Um, 
And so they're not just saying, okay, here's, we're going to make this new policy and, and then nothing ever happens with it. So I think the fact that there's going to be training in the local offices is really exciting um, to have a more victim centered approach. And just the beginning language of it is really good to see that there's, they're going back to a focus on an appreciating appreciation of the importance of victims be able to come forward and advocate for themselves and speak up, you know, in police investigations and court proceedings. And I think that's huge. So this is really, really good news. All right. Uh, anything yeah. to add to that from your side, Zach? Nothing on my side. Okay. Well, let's get into it. Um, we have already a lot of questions, so uh, let's get into it. Um, let's start with uh, this question is about Go. So the Go order is final. It's not though. Go order is not final, Ronald. Um, but good luck needs to have a final judgment after reservation. Can we expect early adjudication of Go plaintiffs, then good luck plaintiffs after final decision on us? Uh, I think that we're like we're we're waiting for the final determination on the merits, not that the final decision has already been made. Okay, got it. Yeah, we are waiting for the final determination um, and it's consolidated. I mean, it's not consolidated, but I would anticipate that we would get a decision that addresses all of the different cases. Uh, I don't know if, if, if that's what you think, Zach, but um, my guess is, is that the issues are interlinked enough that regardless of whether the cases are consolidated or not, there's going to be one decision that addresses all the issues. Yeah, I think a big thing is that relief for the GO plaintiffs will impact really all these cases. So, you know, our final decision can be um, a decision that, it, you know, really affects everybody. So, yeah, I mean, um, we're, we are the lead case, even if it's consolidated. So whatever happens in GO happens to everyone. And if we look at, like, historically with uh, with Gomez, what happened there is, you know, it said, okay, Gomez plaintiffs first and then everybody else. So, yeah. Um, and that's not a guarantee that that will happen, but that was Judge Mehta. It's the same judge. So uh, we anticipate that's happening. The other thing is that, uh, you know, we do know because we've communicated with the government that they've asked for our plaintiff's information, which indicates to us that they're moving on those cases or that they're trying to move on those cases. So um, I don't think ultimately it's a matter of do they go first or we go first or who goes first. I think it's the issue is going to be, you know, how many numbers are reserved and how long is it going to take all of the plaintiffs to get uh, their DV cases? So, all right. This is an H1B question. I'm working on my H1B. It expires 7, 2023, went to India, came back on advanced parole as I don't have an H1B visa. Can I continue working for the same employer to whom I am working before I went to Izzy, India using my 797 approval without using my EAD? until my current H-1B expiry and apply for H-1B extension when required to gain H-1B extension. Okay. So do uh, you got that, Zach? Sure. Yeah. Okay. H-1Bs, they're always mine, right? Um, so, And I can help if you did it, but yeah. We, uh, this is why we generally uh, recommend people to kind of maintain their underlying status when they apply for uh, adjustment of status or, or going to do concert processing, things like that. Um, once you have this approval for your um, extension or whatever it may be of your um, H-1B in the U.S. to July, um, in your case, you, know, you have this status here in the United States that you're allowed to work on in H-1B status. Once you leave, you no longer have that status because you're no longer in the United States. So then when you come back, if for, in order to continue working on an H-1B, you'd have to be entering as an H-1B worker. Um, coming back on advanced parole makes you come back as an adjustment of status applicant, which would require you to work on your employment authorization document. Um, so I guess the, the broad answer is just based off of the facts here is uh, um, you would need to use your employment authorization document because that uh, underlying H-1B approval, um, you know, although you are approved for H-1B, um, you don't have the status of it right now. Thanks, Zach. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see. Another go question. When will be the decision? Will we have to wait for consolidation? Well, we are actually taking a poll, a client poll, for when the decision will be issued. And the winner of the closest 
to the decision coming out by date and time wins a beautiful uh, impact litigation mug from from one of the litigators here. So we have no idea when the decision is coming out. Your guess is as good as mine. And we're having a contest about it. Um, will we have to wait for consolidation? No. Um, if there's going to be consolidation, it'll it'll happen with that with that uh, at the same time. Uh, and it doesn't have to be consolidated. If the judge's order is universal, uh, then it will, then consolidation's sort of irrelevant because it's going to apply to everyone across the board. All right, Penn v. Blinken, Rio. We have an interview scheduled for September 16th. That's fantastic news. Uh, I actually just had an email with an attorney out of Wisconsin today about her individual client who's stuck in um, Rio and you know, they want to know if they can file an individual case. And I told them they can, but they're also wonder, wondering if there are other Rio plaintiffs out there that want to join. Um, they're looking at filing an, another case. So just to let you all know, um, realize that there's two sets of Rio plaintiffs, right? There's the Rio plaintiffs that are in the Milligan case. And then there's the Rio plaintiffs that are in the Penn case. Um, and we've seen movement on both uh, Rio out of Milligan and Rio out of Penn. So this is really good news and uh, look forward to seeing you in, in the United States. As always, send us your pics here, post them on social media and tag us. And uh, we'd love to see those when you get here. So, all right, uh, next one. K1 Cairo, August 3rd had the interview, goes into administrative processing. Then they gave him his passport back and gave him papers, the questions that seem like the DS-160. He's waiting now, doesn't know how much longer. There was an update on the case August 8th. Um, okay, so everybody get that. His case is now in administrative processing. They gave the passport back, but they want him to answer a bunch of DS-160 questions. Yeah, this is something that we have been seeing a lot for, I guess, transfer cases more than uh, than anything. But uh, the Department of State has been issuing these like additional biographic document uh, requests or information requests to, to folks. Um, and putting them in administrative processing. Um, it hasn't, I guess, like universally said, you know, your case is uh, going to be you know, denied or anything like that. Uh, you know, in fact, I think it's quite the opposite. It's just a lot of information gathering that uh, if, they're, if they're missing something that they need. Um, and, you know, a lot of cases, again, this is because of the transfer. So you're, you know, in, in Moscow, and you're going to, to Poland. Uh, the Poland, the embassy in Warsaw doesn't have all the documents that uh, the embassy in Moscow has. So they ask you for you know, additional information. Um, and then it seems like after that gets processed, folks are being approved. Um, your case in particular, I don't know the specific facts enough to, I guess, opine either way. But um, yeah, it's not unusual, I suppose. Um, and it's not a, a signal either way that it's going to be approved or denied. Okay, another pen question. Um, the government has until the 20th to submit their mo amended motion to dismiss. Are we waiting for them to do that before Judge Kelly issues a court date or could he schedule it before they have it in? I'm gonna look up, I'm not aware of an intention to even file an amended motion to dismiss. And usually that doesn't happen unless there was an error in the first one. So I'm not really sure what that's referencing. So, yeah, they had the ability to file, I guess, a supplement to their brief that just, uh, I guess, added more stats, but not. That's, is that what they're referring to as the supplement that I'm got I'm not filed? sure if that was due on the 20th. I thought that was due um, earlier, but um, I guess regardless, um, I mean, we're not necessarily waiting on a court date before Judge Kelly, um, no. we're just waiting for a, a decision on the papers, uh, really, more than anything. So. Um, he could issue it now, he could issue it after the supplemental stats. Uh, yeah. So just to clarify what happened is if you'll recall, there were some plaintiffs uh, left out of the amended complaint because of margins on the formatting for the uh, template. And so we had to file an amended uh, supplement to the amended complaint to add those plaintiffs in. And the government filed a, uh, a, supple a motion, essentially a supplement to their motion to um, dismiss. But all the supplement did was essentially name the plaintiffs and say they're in the same shoes. There's no new argument. It's just we, we apply our previous argument to them. So that's all finished now. So, yes, we're waiting for Judge Kelly to potentially schedule a court date or he could just issue a decision without a hearing. So. 
All right, this is a uh, general question. Construction company, I have a husband who started his construction company. Are there any visas available that we could get workers to come from another country to work in a busy time when he has the most work? Well, I am pleased to say that Zach New is one of the hundred top lawyers in the country probably on H2Bs because there's probably only a hundred lawyers that wow. do H2Bs in the country. So. Wow. Um, so yes, this is a big part of our practice and we can help you. And, and Zach, you wanna kind of give them the basics on how the H2B works? Well, first off, there's uh, certain laws against a hostile workplace environment. Um, <laughs> and if your boss is uh, berating you in public. <laughs> anyways, yeah, there is a um, there is a, a, a specific visa called an H2B visa for uh, low skilled, um, it's just low skilled under the terms of the Department of Labor uses um, workers. Uh, that's contrasting with H-1Bs, which are high skilled. And the way that's differentiated is just with a degree. I mean, obviously you can have you know, high skilled laborers you know, like electricians or you know, high skilled, for example, but um, they would still be classified as this low skilled temporary labor. Um, yeah, it's a it's a kind of complicated process. It involves uh, dealing with uh, three agencies. There's a lot of uh, a lot of compliance that has to go into it. Uh, it's a pretty regulatory heavy program. Um, but you know, being one of the top hundred lawyers of one hundred lawyers in the country, I can tell you it's uh, you know as long as we are taking it step by step, it's not the the most difficult thing in the world. Um, the biggest issues are there are only 66,000 H2B visas available per year. And those are split between the two halves of the fiscal year. So there's 33,000 for folks who have an October 1st start date or later, and then 33,000 for folks who have an April 1st start date or later. And as you can probably imagine, uh, there's a lot more construction companies, landscaping companies, et cetera, that are trying to get the summer visas than those who are trying to get the winter visas. Um, that means that, you know, really January 1st will be, you know, before we have our champagne, um, you know, submitting all of our, our clients' uh, requests for their, their labor certifications with the Department of Labor um, to give them their, their April's first start date. Um, and then at that point, depending on how many folks actually apply for the H2Bs uh, in that particular season, there will be like a kind of a lottery where the Department of Labor will, will group you and say, okay, well, um, you know, this company is going to be in group A and they can apply on January 5th. This company is in group D and you have to wait for us to kind of let you know when you can apply. Um, regardless, um, what happens most years, uh, except for last year, is that when those visas are used up, Congress will come out and say, okay, we see that there's still a huge need for uh, supplemental workers. And because of that, we're going to authorize um, additional H2B visas to be released. Last year, that didn't happen because of COVID. And obviously that would be pretty uh, politically um, it would look bad um, to say, all right, there's massive unemployment and we're going to bring in um, you know, basically temporary workers to cover these jobs um, rather than have U.S. workers fill them. It's not, you know, when you get down to the facts, not what happens because you do actually have to test the labor market in some way and you do have to do certain recruiting to try to bring in U.S. workers. Um, but still, it was, you know, politically not expedient uh, to say we're going to bring in extra workers last year. This year, they did issue some additional visas, but again, COVID is still going on. So uh, there were strings attached to them that there uh, usually aren't. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, they had to be uh, returning workers. They had to be H2B workers who uh, had previously held an H2B visa. And that uh, you know, for some people was kind of a deal breaker and for others was not. Um, or you had to, to bring folks from kind of Central American countries, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Um, but I guess, broad answer to your question is yes there is a visa available that would be the visa and the process is complicated so give us a call yeah it, it's something that you definitely want to have a consult with an immigration attorney who knows about h2b's and there's not a lot of them um, because you know you'd want to look at the job itself and decide really is the job a peak load job you know for part of the year or is it year round because there's the H2B process, which is for you know workers for less than a one year, and then there's the PERM process or labor certification process for workers who are full time year round. So those are your you know three sixty five days a year. So if you can, if the job itself is really a year round job, then we would steer you away from H2B towards permanent residence because those individuals come in with permanent residence and their families and they're good here forever. 
with the H2B, you have to do the same process for the same worker year after year after year. And it's, it's very expensive and time consuming. So uh, we'd want to look carefully about whether we would start you in H2B or just go straight for green card. Um, but if we do H2B, um, you know, you really, you can file for those workers 90 days before your date of need. So if you need the workers on April 1st, we are going to be filing those on January 1st, which means really you need to be contacting us well before that, right? To start working on those April 1st things. So like now's the time to start thinking about the uh, April 1st filings. So, all right, let's go back to the questions here. Um, another go question. Uh, so this is a hard question to answer, Hani, because I don't, when you say the go, the government has canceled August interviews, I don't know to whom you're referring. I assume that's the Department of State, a particular consulate. Um, so, you know, we're monitoring individual consulates and what's going on with DV cases, but it, to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter which consulate because the delay is sort of global. It's worldwide. So, um, you know, so yes, the judge is very well aware of what's going on with all the visa numbers. Uh, every time we have an opportunity to file something, we are updating the judge. So um, we should have a decision very soon. And um, as soon as we do, we'll let you know. Another one, uh, can you please email the latest filing on the GO case? Um, yes, we can do that. We'll need to redact it, but I, I believe that we're now posting those online. So I'll check to make sure with Greg where, that, where that's posted and get it out to you. Uh, let's see. Last week, I mentioned that I would contact the USA regarding Milligan round two. Um, to be honest with you, the I think really all that's remaining is Manila. So um, yes, I'm going to communicate with with Mr. Carilli, Carilli, but it's more going to be about the difference between you know the way that the Ramirez plaintiffs are be treat, being treated and the way that the Milligan plaintiffs are being treated. So and why there's a difference. So um, I will be reaching out to him. This is my list of things to do today. And that is number seven. So I promise you I'll be doing that. All right. Next one. Did you provide both primary and dependent A numbers and receipt numbers to the U.S. attorney for the EB complaint? No, we didn't. We only filed, we only um, submitted the primary uh, numbers because that's all they asked for. They didn't ask for any of the de dependents. Presumably those dependent files are attached to the primaries anyways. And so don't worry about that. If the primaries are going to get processed, the dependents get processed as, as what's called following to join or accompanying. So don't worry about that. Um, if the, we're, we're, they're really focused on the primaries at this point. I would like a consultation with you, Sandra. I would also like a consultation with you. So yes, you can call us and set that up. In fact, let's go ahead and put that number on the banner right now. This is our phone number and uh, you can call to schedule an appointment anytime. Um, this is it right here. Happy to take your, your consultations and help you out with uh, your immigration issues. All right, a couple more. Um, let's see. K1 Manila, again, thanks for all you do. We know the judge can take as long as he wants. Any ballpark on how long to make a decision and which factors will be weighing to make his determination? Uh, gosh, um, well, let me just give you some context. So the first thing you need to know is that um, immigration filings around the country are up significantly. I mean, I would say 100% from where they have been in the past. And most of those cases need to be filed in D.C. because that's where the agency is. And so that's where you sue. So these judges are flooded with immigration cases. And secondly, uh, they don't just do immigration cases. They've got civil and criminal dockets. And, you're, you know, we all recall what happened January 6th at the Capitol. Uh, those 600 people are being prosecuted in D.C. District Court. So all of those judges are also inundated with criminal prosecutions. So it could take a while, to be honest with you. And uh, I, I have no ability to predict how long or when it's going to happen. Um, all that we can do as your lawyers is uh, continue to update you when we hear things, communicate with the government, and as there's developments with what's going on around the world, update the court. But we can't, we cannot push a judge to do what we want the judge to do whenever we want it to happen, unfortunately. So, 
All right. Well, that takes us to uh, past the 30 minutes. And so I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we will be back again next week. It's always different people depending on who's available and, and uh, what, what your questions are. But um, we will be back and we'll see you next week on Thursday at two o'clock Eastern. Take care. Have a great week, everybody.